Hello everyone, this is Anurag again. Uh, sorry for the slight delay in this second video. I was on call for almost last one and a half to two weeks and you know how that can get. But well, we are back to it and let's start without further delay. So today I'm going to be talking about chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic lymphoma. And um, it is one of the most common, if not the most common um, leukemia slash lymphoma, especially in the Western countries. So I'm going to try to present it like a case uh, that usually presents uh, that usually presents to the doctor's office and what are the clinical features and then how it progresses through. And this is like... Um, an imaginary case this is not an actual case uh, so um, if I and I am I've put in some symptoms and signs just so that I get a complete information but pa patients can have varied information so let's just start with the doctor's office so this is the doctor's office the doctor is having a wonderful evening and then a patient arrives the patient says hey doc I am a 60 year old male so doctor says well welcome 60 year old male how can I help you well no nothing much uh, I'm just here for my routine physical examination so um, doctor says okay so do you have any symptoms so you know I don't have any symptoms but I just did a routine blood work and I found uh, and another doctor told me that there was an increase in lymphocytes in my blood doctor said hmm let's just do a physical examination and on the physical examination there was a mild increase in lymph nodes um, or in any region it's usually in the neck but it can be anywhere in the body so this is a 60 year old male who presented for a routine checkup and there was increase in lymphocytes in the peripheral blood the patient does not have any symptoms and on physical examination there was mild increase in lymph nodes um, in the neck say so the doctor says, well, uh, let's just, um, you know, do a peripheral blood smear examination and also just send, uh, do an excisional biopsy of the lymph node and send it to the pathologist. And while you're here, let me just introduce you to your clinical, uh, to your care team and that includes the clinician that is the doctor um, that is the hematologist oncologist or the primary care physician um, and then it includes the pathologist the pathologist is the one who will be looking at the smear will be looking at the biopsies will be also looking at others um, um, other testing modalities like flow cytometry molecular testing and will be um, letting the clinician know what uh, kind of pathology there is what kind of disease there is and that will help guide further treatment and the radiologist the radiologist will help by looking at the various imaging modalities and finding out what other areas in the body can uh, may or may not be involved by the disease and so this is the complete team that works together that helps in treating the patient so now let's move on to the pathologist office so it was a warm sunny day the resident was going through slides and it was mostly just routine stuff. There was nothing interesting going on. So the resident on hematopathology then came across this peripheral blood smear from this 60 year old male. So what do we see in this peripheral blood smear? Well, this is the peripheral blood smear here. So we see that there are these uh, lymphocytes that are not very large, but I mean, they're uh, they are like intermediate side but mostly they are like smaller in size They're, the nucleus of these lymphocytes is almost the size of the red blood cells so these are like small uh, small to intermediate but I'll just say small lymphocytes but what is um, most striking about these lymphocytes is look at this nucleus here this nucleus kind of has this clumped chromatin in it and if you notice that on the top right I have put a soccer ball there right so there is this this nucleus it kind of if you would stretch your imagination it looks like a soccer ball look at this nucleus here on the top left this I mean I would say this does look like this soccer ball here right so the peripheral blood findings what we see is that there is increased number of lymphocytes and they are mostly small they have this clumped soccer ball like chromatin and the cytoplasm is like scant like if you see here this cytoplasm it's like scanned it's like a thin strip of cy uh, cytoplasm on the nucleus and it's like pale to basophilic in color so just to summarize small lymphoid cells clumped soccer ball like chromatin and scanned pale to basophilic cytoplasm and this is very characteristic of chronic lymphocytic leukemia small lymphocytic lymphoma so now let's look at the uh, lymph node excision so this is the low power view of the lymph node that was excised and you see that the, it is uh, the architecture of the lymph node is not readily apparent I cannot see follicles here I cannot see even primary or secondary follicles here what I see is a diffuse sea of 
blue and there are these darker areas and then there are some of these lighter staining areas in the middle but they are not kind of forming any nodules it's just like there are lighter staining areas and there are darker staining areas like vague probably here as well so let's just go to higher power so in higher power again um, this is again there are some of these darker areas and then again there are some of these lighter areas and at this low power I can say that they are mostly like small looking cells but I'm still not very sure so let's go even higher so this is the high power view of the darker areas and you can see that most of these lymphocytes or these lymphoid cells they are um, small in size uh, they and if we zoom further into the image we can see that they have again these this clumped like chromatin in here and they are small monotonous and um, they look similar to each other is what I want to say they look similar to each other they are small they are monotonous and they have that clumped chromatin now let us look at a high power image from one of these lighter staining areas that we saw so in this lighter staining areas this is the high power image from that area you see that there are there are slightly different kinds of cells here as well so if you look at the top right here there are these smaller cells here and then in the center here look at this cell here this one and if we zoom in further you see this has this kind of you know a vesicular that means a uh, white area that is like uh, cleared out areas in the nucleus and has this prominent red color nucleolus in the middle so these are these larger cells here again we see one cell here like that and then there are these cells here as well and then there are some of the lymphocytes which are also slightly larger than the other lymphocytes that is the smaller lymphocytes that we saw around so and again we see these larger cells here so this is what is called as a proliferation center so proliferation center consists of the small lymphoid cells then it consists of some intermediate side cells that are called as prolymphocytes and there are some larger cells that we saw here that is with the prominent red cherry red uh, like nucleolus and then uh, the vesicular chromatin and they are called as paraimmunoblasts so that's a proliferation center now as always we always have to do stains why do we need to do stains because first of all we need to know whether these lymphocytes are B lymphocytes or T lymphocytes or are they lymphoid cells or not and then we have there are specific staining characteristics of different kinds of lymphomas and leukemias and let's just go through the staining pattern so always we do uh, B cell markers and T cell markers so first of all let's begin with the B cell marker this is CD20 CD20 is a B cell marker it is a cytoplasmic marker that is uh, you'll see that all of these cells are staining with CD20 and the stain is the brown color and the unstained that is the counter stain is the blue color that is just showing the cells that are not stained and you see that the cells here the stain is only staining the cytoplasm it is not staining the nucleus because CD20 is a cytoplasmic stain and we always like to do two stains just to confirm the lineage so we'll do another B cell marker that is PAX5 this is PAX5 and PAX5 you'll notice here is a nuclear stain so this is staining the nucleus of the cells let's just compare again so the CD20 it is staining the cytoplasm and PAX5 that is uh, staining the nucleus so these are pretty good indicators that the cells that we are looking at are B cells or B lineage cells and then let's go on to CD3 now CD3 is a T cell marker and uh, we, uh, we see that there are some cells that are staining for CD3 but the large majority of the cells as you see here there are some small brown cells here but the large majority of the cells that is the blue cells they're not staining for CD3 we do another uh, T cell marker that is CD5 uh oh so is it a T cell or is it a B cell because CD5 here is staining well CD5 is usually used as a T cell marker but there are certain B cell lymphomas that are positive for CD5 excuse me <coughs> there are certain B cell lymphomas as I was saying they are positive for CD5 and it is a very important marker that helps us distinguish between certain kinds of lymphomas so those lymphomas are called as CD5 positive B cell lymphomas so we have already established that this is a B cell lymphoma because it is CD20 positive and it's PAX5 positive it is negative for CD3 it's positive for CD5 now CD5 positive B cell lymphomas mostly include uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia slash small lymphocytic lymphoma and mantle cell lymphoma so let's do further stains that is CD23 now again CD23 is also positive in a large proportion of these cells and it is again as you can see a cytoplasmic stain and um, 
and the last stain that we did is cyclin D1 and cyclin D1 is a nuclear stain but here as you can see it is dead negative so why did we do cyclin D1 as I was talking about CD5 positive B cell lymphomas they include CLL SLL and mantle cell lymphoma now mantle cell lymphoma will be positive for cyclin D1 um, and CLL will be negative for cyclin D1 and also the CD23 CD23 also helps support a diagnosis of uh, CLL SLL over a mantle cell lymphoma so this is very important and why do we need to differentiate between mantle cell lymphoma and CLL because the treatments are different and mantle cell lymphoma is more aggressive than CLL SLL so just uh, to summarize uh, so morphology the lymph node will be enlarged there will be a diffuse infiltration by mature B cells then we saw those pale staining areas that we call the proliferation centers which contain small lymphocytes medium sized pro lymphocytes and large para immunoblasts which have that dispersed or vesicular chromatin and prominent nucleoli I don't have an image of the bone marrow here uh, and uh, uh, but if uh, in the bone marrow in early CLL SLL um, it has a nodular or interstitial pattern in advanced disease there will be a diffuse infiltrate of small B cells in the bone marrow but this point is very important that it spares the paratrabicular areas why is this important because uh, some other lymphomas like follicular lymphoma they like to involve the paratrabicular area of the bone marrow and before I move further I would like to acknowledge Dr. Kyle Bradley who very kindly uh, you know allowed me to use his image from Twitter and he's up um, he's an attending at Emory University here and he's uh, I shout out to Dr. Bradley for letting me use this image thank you so much Dr. Bradley all right let's move further um, then uh, let's look at the immunohistochemical stains so CLL SLL will be positive for pan B cell markers that is CD19 CD20 CD79A PAX5 it is also positive for CD5 which is a very important marker CD23 and LEF1 which is positive in 95% of cases now CLL SLL will be negative for CD10 this is very important it helps us to distinguish it from uh, follicular lymphoma BCL6 cyclin D1 and SOX11 so cyclin D1 and SOX11 help us differentiate it from mantle cell lymphoma now there are some histological variants of CLL there is something called as histologically aggressive CLL that is um, uh, so it, uh, you remember the proliferation centers that we were talking about if those proliferation centers they become large prominent and confluent and what I mean by large is that if we are looking at a 20x field and all we can see is that lighter staining proliferation center that is what is called as um, large prominent proliferation centers that is they occupy more than a 20x field and or a high proliferation index that is determined by presence of more than 2.4 mitosis per proliferation center or of more than 40 percent ki67 staining uh, per proliferation center so that's called as a histologically aggressive CLL so it's more aggressive as the name suggests than the typical CLL then there is something called as pro lymphocytic progression so you remember we talked about the intermediate size lymphocytes those are called as pro lymphocytes now if the pro lymphocytes are more than 15 percent of the total lymphocytes in the peripheral blood that's a pro lymphocytic progression and that is associated with TP53 disruptions and we'll talk about uh, TP53 later on in the molecular part of the section um, so let's uh, go into the flow cytometry now so the this is the flow cytometry that we see here so let's just first go over the how what areas of the plot will show what types of cells so this as you can see here on the y-axis we have the SSC which is also called as uh, which is a short form for side scatter and on the x-axis we have CD45 which is a marker for hematolymphoid cells so usually side scatter indicates so you see on the y-axis side scatter indicates the complexity of the cells that is if a cell has more granularity in it it would have it would have a higher complexity and it would have a higher side scatter so you see this purple population here this this population represents the granulocytes and that is the neutrophils the, uh, the eosinophils the neutrophils and other myelocytes and metamyelocytes so those are the granulocytes the granulocytes base as the name suggests they contain granules in the cytoplasm and so they are more complex so they will be high in side scatter and they're uh, and also they are positive for CD45 but not very brightly positive but still positive and then we have 
this population here that is this blue population here this is cd5 po uh, cd45 positive and it has a low side scatter so it means that it is um, not a very complex cell these represents the lymphocytes and just above the lymphocytes that is highlighted in green these are the monocytes that is they are also cd45 positive and have a slightly higher side scatter that is slightly higher complexity than lymphocytes but lower than the granulocytes then this is the second gate that is very important that is the red cells here these represent the cd45 dim population this cd45 dim population includes hematogons that is right at the bottom which we can't really separately see here but hematogons are basically the immature normal immature lymphoid cells then we can also see blasts and we can also see basophils here so this gate is important for assessing the blasts the basophils and the hematogons and then there is a cd45 negative gate this includes the nucleated red blood cells and also there are plasma cells which usually show up here but it's mostly the uh, nucleated red blood cells here all right let's just um, let's just remove all these all right so now this is of the uh, this is of the CLL SLL patient so what do we see here we see here that there is a large population of the CD45 uh, positive cells that is this blue colored population uh, th uh, th and it is there's a large uh, large in uh, not in size but in larger amount that is in number there is an increase in number of these lymphocytes here that is the CD45 positive lymphocytes let's go to the next plot so this next plot shows CD19 which is a B cell marker and CD20 which is again a B cell marker so you see there is this large dark blue population here that is positive for CD19 and it is dim for CD20 it's very important that is this population is dim because if it was say CD20 bright it would have been somewhere here so this is like CD20 dim and CD19 positive let's go to the next plot now again CD19 which is a B cell marker CD5 which is usually used for T cells but uh, as I just uh, as I briefly talked about that there are CD5 positive B cell lymphomas and this is why CD5 is very important so you see again this dark blue positive uh, this dark blue population that is positive for CD19 is also positive for CD5 and this small blue population here these are the T cells which are negative for CD19 but are positive for CD5 so our population of interest which is this dark blue population CD19 positive CD5 positive dim for CD20 all right the next plot shows that it's negative for cd10 again cd19 that is the b cell marker cd10 which is a marker which help which is a germinal center marker and helps us in differentiating it from follicular lymphoma and um, it's negative this large blue population is negative for cd10 all right next plot this is a marker uh, this is a plot between cd200 and cd19 and you see this dark blue population is bright for cd200 this is again very important and i'll um, talk about it in the differential diagnosis why it's important so we have a population that is cd19 positive cd5 positive cd20 dim cd200 bright all right the next plot is kappa and lambda so kappa and lambda are light change are light chains and usually uh, normally if the b cells are like normal and they're not lymphomatous we usually see some of the cells going into the kappa side some of the cells going into the lambda side with a usual ratio of three is to one but here there is something wrong right this large dark blue population is all going towards the kappa side so this large the b cell population is restricted for kappa and what's more important usually uh, the B cells when they express kappa or lambda they are usually up here that is they are bright they are usually bright for kappa uh, or lambda whatever they are expressing if they are normal but here this surface kappa is dim so that's also very important the surface immunoglobin is dim so so far what did we see CD19 positive CD5 positive CD20 dim CD200 bright and kappa restricted but dim kappa the next is a plot between CD38, CD38 and CD19 and you see that this population that is CD19 positive is negative for CD38. Why is that important? I'll talk about this in the molecular part but this is important because CD38 positivity in CLL SLL um, gives a poor prognosis to that case and I'll talk about it later on as well. So just to summarize flow cytometric findings there is CD19 positive, CD20 dim, CD5 positive, 200 bright, surface immunoglobulin dim and CD11C which I didn't show here is variable. Negative for CD10 for FMC7 which also 
helps us in uh, differentiating it from mantle cell lymphoma, CD25 and CD103, which I didn't show here in the plot. All right, so this so far, so all this information helps us in making a diagnosis of CLL slash SLL, that is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic lymphoma. And just to define uh, how the WHO defines CLL, so the peripheral blood B cells of more than 5 into 10 to the power 9 per liter with characteristic morphology and immunophenotype, which we discussed before. And SLL is usually peripheral blood B cells less than 5 into 10 to the power 9 with organ involvement, that is lymph node, spleen or others. So these are essentially the same disease. It just depends if there is organ involvement. We also call it small lymphocytic lymphoma. Now this is the important part. What's the differential diagnosis? We talked about mantle cell lymphoma. So mantle cell lymphoma morphologically it would have irre more irregular nuclei as compared to the CLL SLL. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, uh, yeah, excuse me. So I'll repeat that again. Mantle cell lymphoma would have more irregular nuclei as compared to CLL, SLL. Mantle cell lymphoma, importantly, is also CD5 positive, but it is negative for cyclin D1. Uh, sorry, it is positive for cyclin D1, SOX11. It is CD200 dim. Remember, I was talking about why CD200 and CD20 are important. So it is CD200 dim and CD20 bright. So mantle cell lymphoma, morphologically irregular nuclei, positive for CD5, but negative for CD23, positive for cyclin D1, positive for SOX11, CD200 dim, CD20 bright. Then there is another differential diagnosis of follicular lymphoma, but usually follicular lymphoma would have a follicular architecture and the cells will be positive for CD10, BCL2 and they will be negative for CD5. That's why CD5 is very important. And another differential diagnosis would be marginal zone lymphoma. So marginal zone lymphoma would usually have marginal zone expansion, would have monocytoid appearance, they uh, can have plasmacytic differentiation, and they are again negative for CD5 and CD23. So differentials include mantle cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, and marginal zone lymphoma. So we have made a diagnosis of uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic lymphoma that is involving the lymph nodes and uh, so the patient goes back to the doctor and now the treatments uh, it, uh, they can differ some uh, sometimes they can be a wait and watch approach it depends on various factors the patient's age the patient's ability to handle chemotherapy and the extent of the disease and other factors but i'm not a, he um, a hemato-oncologist um, uh, hemato-oncologists will be better able to uh, tell you about the treatments of CLL, SLL. Uh, so just for the sake of this lecture, I'm not saying that this is how the patient will be treated, just for the sake of this presentation so that we can see how CLL, SLL naturally progresses if there was no treatment given to the patient. Um, and um, it, there's a lot of factors. I'm not saying that uh, a wait and watch approach is uh, not good. It's That depends on the, depends on multiple factors. It's just on the basis of just for the sake of this lecture. So suppose the patient now comes to the doctor's office again. Just for this lecture, the patient suppose was not treated. Okay, I'm not saying that the patient usually does not get any treatment or wait and watch approach is wrong. It just depends on the hemato-oncologist. So the patient now presents with fever, fatigue, weight loss, night sweats, rapid and asymmetric growth of the lymph nodes. So now the patient, uh, now the uh, clinician is concerned. They say that this, these are concerning features, right? Uh, initially, the patient didn't have any symptoms. And uh, there are there is a large number of lymph nodes as well now. The patient is also not feeling well. So they send a excisional lymph node biopsy back to the pathologist. Let's go back to the pathology office. And what do we see here? This looks a lot different than what we had earlier on right these are there are these large cells which have these prominent nucleoli and these uh, we saw a few of the larger cells in the proliferation center but they were not nearly as much as they are here right larger cells prominent nucleoli and there are sheets of these large cells everywhere and how can i say that they are large you see there are some of these small lymphocytes and look at the size of this large cell compared to the small lymphocyte it's almost three to four times as large so larger cells uh, with the sheets of large cells. So this is something, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> let me just, let me just take a quick, quick sip of water. 
So there's these large sheets of cells that have these prominent nuclei and that's um, that's called a Richter's transformation and it's a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and Richter's transformation is usually a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma or classic Hodgkin lymphoma and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma there will be sheets of large cells and usually it is a non-germinal center type. Um, I mean, uh, so diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, just to quickly state it, and we can talk about diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in another video, but diffuse large B-cell lymphoma can be germinal center type and non-germinal center type, and it depends upon various staining characteristics and other features that we take into account. So usually it is the non-germinal center type. The classic Hodgkin lymphoma will have the classic reed Sternberg cell. You remember the owl's eye cells with the prominent nucleoli? the classic reed Sternberg cells um, with the with the usual background background of classic Hodgkin lymphoma as the lymphocytes eosinophils um, and other cells so this is what is called as Richter transformation and this is not a very good thing to happen there would be more aggressive chemotherapy and it also affects the prognosis all right so now let's talk about the molecular aspect so majority of cases of CLL SLL will have at least one out of the four of the following recurrent chromosomal abnormalities by by fish. So these include deletion 11Q, deletion 13Q, trisomy 12, and deletion 17P. So why I have highlighted 17P because it leads to loss of TP53, and TP53 can be lost because of deletion 17P, but it can also be mutated instead of just loss of 17P. So why am I stressing so much on TP53? Because anything that happens to TP53, that is deletion or mutations, they are biomarkers of chemotherapy resistance. So that is why this TP53 becomes the most important prognostic factor. So either deletion 17P or mutations in TP53 can lead to chemotherapy resistance and can, uh, can, uh, can affect the prognosis making it worse. And then there is another uh, type of classification of CLL which can be divided into mutated and unmutated. Uh, so mutated CLL means that there have been a lot of somatic hypermutations in the rearranged IGHV genes and we talked about the VDJ rearrangements and the somatic hypermutation in my previous video on B cell maturation and I'll just put a link to that video in the description box. So um, this means is that the cell, the neoplastic cell has gone through the germinal center, has had the VDJ rearrangements previously before the germinal center, then went through the germinal center and underwent somatic hypermutations. Usually these types of CLL are negative for CD38, ZAP70 and CD49D and they usually have a good or better prognosis than the unmutated CLL. The unmutated CLL means that they have few or no somatic hypermutations in the rearranged IGHV genes. That is, they might not have gone through the germinal center, so they didn't have a somatic hypermutation in them. They overexpress ZAP70 CD38. You remember we talking about in flow cytometry that the R cells there were CD38 negative and why it was important? It's because of this. Presence of CD38 indicates that this might be an unmutated CLL SLL and they have a bad prognosis. So uh, that is CLL SLL can be mutated and unmutated. So this is um, um, this is all about CLL SLL, and now I'll just briefly go over a summary. Uh, for people who just want to quickly summarize, so CLL, that is peripheral B cells, more than 510 to the power 9 per liter, with characteristic morphology and immunophenotype. SLL is just peripheral blood B cells less than 510 to the power 9, but with organ involvement, that is lymph nodes, spleen, or others. Clinical features. Increase in lymphocytes can present with no symptoms but can also present with fever, fatigue, weight loss, night sweats and rapid asymmetric uh, growth of lymph nodes and these kind of indicate uh, you know, a Richter's transformation or an aggressive type of CLL. Morphology, peripheral blood um, uh, can include small lymphoid cells um, with a clump soccer ball like chromatin with scanned pale to basophilic cytoplasm. Lymph node is usually enlarged with a diffuse infiltration with mature B cells, pale staining proliferation centers which contain uh, uh, small lymphocytes, medium-sized pro-lymphocytes, and paraimmunoblasts. Um, immunohistochemical, positive for pan B cell markers, positive for CD5s and CD23, negative for cyclin D1 and SOX11. Then bone marrow, early CLL usually has a nodular and interstitial pattern. Um, advanced CLL has diffuse pattern and it spares the paratrabicular areas. And these are just the images that we went over before. 
histologically aggressive CLL that is large prominent um, uh, proliferation centers covering more than 20x field and or high proliferation index, pro-lymphocytic progression, pro-lymphocytes more than 15%, flow cytometry again CD19 positive, CD20 dim, 5 positive, 200 bright, uh, surface immunoglobulin dim, negative for CD10, FMC7, 25 and 103. These are the images, these are the plots for the uh, for the flow cytometry findings and then we have Richter's transformation which can be diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, classic Hodgkin lymphoma and molecular. We talked about deletion 11Q, 13Q, trisomy 12, deletion 17P and uh, how loss of TP53 TP or mutations of P TP53 can lead to chemotherapy resistance and therefore they become the most important prognostic factor. And then we also talked about mutated CLL and unmutated CLL. Um, and the mute with the mutated one having a good prognosis and the unmutated one having a bad prognosis and how do we discover whether it's mutated or unmutated it's because of the presence of cd38 zap70 and cd49d in the unmutated cll well this is the end of the video i'm just gonna give you a bird's eye view again of all the images and um, i hope you liked it and um, most of m uh most of the information here is from the WHO uh, classification of hematopathologi hematopathological tumors and um, it's both fourth and the fifth edition and again thank you for uh, to Dr. Kyle Bradley for letting me use his image uh, for CLL SLL and um, please let me know if you uh, if you have any suggestions or if you would like me to present something different and thank you for watching.